Labyrinths is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. Please consider becoming a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you can listen to Labyrinths ad-free. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson to learn more. I'm really excited to talk to you because, I mean, the last time we spoke, basically, you were trying to figure out if you wanted to tell a tale. Yes. What? <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah. So, like, it's quite what, a tale. I, maybe I want to just go back to that moment for a yeah. second. Like, the day that we met in that coffee shop, mm-hmm. what was going on? What was going on was I was getting closer. I was recording the audiobook, and the sound engineer put us in touch um, and said, you would have some insight about this question that I had, which was, should I release under a pseudonym or my own name? And is it even, should I even release the book at all? Was Mm. it just, was this endeavor something that was for me? Or is this going to be worthwhile for someone else? Is this going to matter to someone else? And is it worth exposing myself and exposing my family for what it might mean to someone else? Feeling lost? Then you're in the right place. I'm Amanda Knox. And I'm Christopher Robinson. And this is is Labyrinths. That was Minda Lane, author of Men, Myself, and I, Revelations of an Opened Marriage. Minda and Amanda sat down for an intimate and philosophical conversation about non-monogamy and how it can impact your sense of self, the good that can come from being vulnerable, and how we can feel less alone in our traumas by sharing them. And so those were the thoughts that I was having. Those are the things I was wondering about and vexed by. And I was so grateful for your time. It was so kind of you to agree to meet. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that really made the difference for me was there were a couple things that you said. One was really, I felt like you empowered me to tell my story and the story that I wanted to tell. Like, this is what happened. It reminds me of, there's a book called The Situation and the Story by Vivian Gornick. And the situation is what happened. And the story is what made what you make of it. Mm. And you kind of reminded me of that. Like, this is your story and you get to make of this what you want. And so that was one one moment that really, you know, that meant a lot to me. And then also just seeing your courage, um, you know, I asked you something along the lines of, why not just become like Megan Smith? Like, why be Amanda Knox? You know, which is a little bit of a devil's advocate question, because I wasn't saying I think you should have gone, you know, and pretended you were someone else and changed your name and bleached your hair or whatever. But just, I'm sure you thought about it, you know. Sure, I, definitely I could, crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, more than once. So, you know, I, I you said, if I had done that, and if I had receded into the shadows, so to speak, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning, and I think it's important to mention that you had no reason to recede into the shadows, and it would have been a it would have been a way of giving away your own power and allowing others to define your life for you. And you said you're not going to do that, and so that you know that you you sort of modeled that, but you also said something along the lines of, if I had done that, I would have felt like I had a scream inside me, and and no way to get it out, no way to tell my story, no way to make meaning of it. Mm-hmm. And that was so significant to me. And mm-hmm. you know, after our conversation, I really still felt like a lot was stewing in me, but. It, I knew, I think, when I got in my car and <laughs> waved goodbye. I was like, okay, this is happening. I'm going to do this. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe um, we should start this by, first of all, asking you to introduce yourself as much as you want to share with our mm-hmm. audience. And then can you tell me about the scream inside of you? Yeah. I realized I wasn't happy in our marriage, and that was really the impetus to start to think about an alternative. And I thought I wasn't happy because of our personal life. And so then the answer would lie in in changing that. And so I started to think about it and get comfortable with the idea in my own mind. I never said anything to my husband about it or anything else, anyone else, and never did anything about it. And 
gradually started to, it's almost like it started to kind of wear down my resolve. And I started a relationship with a former partner uh, where we were just sexting. So it seemed like, okay, but it was really enlivening. Hmm. So it felt like I probably shouldn't be doing this, but also it's not that bad. Right. I'm not actually doing it. Yeah, He didn't touch me. I haven't even seen him, you know, but then I figured out a way to see him. And, and then, you know, we shared a hug, a long hug. And I was like, that, that feels like it was probably not really in keeping with my marriage vows. But I didn't, again, do anything really. So it wasn't, it, it was really what was happening inside me that was the sort of betrayal. But it was happening so fast that, and my feelings were shifting. And it was all intense and overwhelming. And there's so much shame associated with it because, you know, I didn't, want to feel this way. I wanted to just be satisfied with my husband and my marriage and be content. I didn't, I didn't like that this is how I felt, but I also couldn't change it. And so eventually I proposed to my husband, Jack, that we would open our marriage and he was amenable to that. And we did, and things didn't go well. (laughs) So (laughs) the the product or the, the scream in me was, um, you know, it started out as just like, what the fuck just happened? Mm-hmm. And needing to write that. And the first draft really was, it was like, here's a bunch of sex I had and I don't know how to make sense of it. And oh my God, you guys, it was like crazy. Oh my God. You know, it was kind of this shallow, it's kind of the feeling of like laughing when something's not actually funny, but you don't know quite how to process the emotion of it. Sure. It had that energy about it, I think, mm-hmm. that first draft. And around the same time, I heard the quote to slow down where it hurts when you're writing. And I was hearing intuitively, I was hearing, you have to write about your dad. Hmm. And I was like, oh, fuck no. (laughs) I am (laughs) definitely not writing that story. I'm so sick of that storyline in my life of having had early childhood trauma related to my relationship with my dad. And I wanted to avoid it and um, realized I couldn't. If I wanted to tell an honest story, I couldn't. Mm. And so that became, um, you know, the beginning of releasing the scream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I was wondering if I could just like chat with you a little bit about what it was like to enter into that, what I think is um, becoming a definitely more, um, not just popular, but more accepted alternative mm-hmm. lifestyle to the very, you know, <laughs> cut and dry monogamous marriage route that all of us are sort of told to go down. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious to know, like, how did you sort of encounter that idea? How did that idea sort of develop inside of you? And how did you get the courage to actually mm. pull the trigger? Yeah, I think it's something a lot of people wonder about. And um, Jack and I used to always listen to Dan Savage. We would listen to the Savage Love Cast and hear about people, you know, with these sort of creative arrangements around their marriages or relationships. And, you know, we'd sort of talk hypothetically, you know, in this very, like, obtuse way. (laughs) Like, what do you think about that? You know, we're, like, not facing each other. We're just side by side driving in the car or whatever, you know, like, oh, well, that sounds kind of interesting that they're doing that. Um, I think that, you know, seeing it for the first time, my sister is in a film and we went to the preview of the film and she mentioned that the filmmaker sitting in front of her is, she just said, that's the filmmaker. And she said, and that's his girlfriend next to him. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And that's his wife on the other side. And I was like, oh, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Go on, you know, (laughs) Um, how does that work? And so I, I just was so distracted. I found myself very taken with the whole concept, you know, like the remainder of the evening. And, you know, to be honest, it probably speaks to, um, you know, I'm not like a proponent of free love or something, but also I'm not not a proponent of free love. Sure. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, I, freedom is a, is a key value for me. And so while I have a, an, an aspect of me that is, I think it stems from trauma, honestly. I think that, you know, having a, having a childhood that was very unstable, I, ha- I have bought into the belief that, 
you know, like the two and a half kids, m- mom, dad, two and a half kids, minivan, white picket fence, cat and dog kind of lifestyle would would mean stability because it's not what I grew up with. Um, and so I think that I have sought that or imagined that that was my value and imagined that that would that would be sort of the antidote and the way that I would provide security for my own family, for my own children children, excuse me, that is like starkly in contrast with who I am, Mm -hmm. like my persona, my, you know, every, my, my ideology, the way my mind works and what I value. Freedom is fundamental to that and freedom and and, and personal expression. And both of those are aspects um, that monogamy is not, not, I I would say that monogamy is not well suited to, um, cultivating personal expression because there's so much of our lives that happen and unfold in relationship with other people. And especially in an intimate relationship, there's so many elements of yourself that you explore in relating with someone else. And you and I are going to cover different ground than, you know, Susie and I, like just in a friendship, you know, we're we're just different people. We relate differently. It's the chemistry is different, right? It's like our chemical bonds are going to be different. I think that just, it spoke to something deeper than this sort of like grasping for security, you know? Mm. And so it it also put me at odds within myself. Um, I started to think about it more. It was very much in my mind for the first like two years. Um, And then I saw an example of it. Again, this was actually my first ayahuasca ceremony was in 2017. And I had been thinking about it for a little while and had had a conversation at work with a guy who's, they were opening their marriage and and that he knew someone that was opening their marriage. And it was because the woman had experienced sexual trauma with a man and she wanted to explore relationships with women. Mm. So this woman was married to a man, but she wanted to explore a relationship with a woman. And I had always kind of been bi curious. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? I wonder if that's like a viable option. Like, I wonder if Jack would go for that, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, and I wasn't even in that state yet of like, forming a a pitch or whatever to him. Um, But it did occur to me like, oh, that's kind of appealing. And then I went, like I said, to this ayahuasca ceremony and there was a woman there with her husband who was also very affectionate with another man. And her husband was very affectionate with another woman. And I just watched them all weekend. It was a two ceremony retreat. So it was like Friday to Sunday. And on Sunday morning before we left, the husband and the girlfriend were outside and they were kind of walking past where I was. And I said, uh, oh, 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 excuse me. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah. And I said, I, I, I'm just wondering if I could ask you a wildly inappropriate question that's none of my business. <laughs> They're like, um, yeah. And I'm like, oh, what is going on here? Like, what is the deal? I mean, I think I know what's going on, but like, how does that work? Yeah. And so they told me and they were so positive about it and affirming. And it just seemed like everybody was all happy. And Mm. it was all just like, you know, very well considered and uh, that it was working for them. And I thought, okay, like this is kind of meant to be. It was a serendipitous event. You know, I was thinking about it. And here was this example of it right before my very eyes. And the wife half of the couple who I had met at that ceremony, we just really clicked right off the bat and became good friends. And so then I had an opportunity to like grill her for more information of like, how does this work? So eventually it was after that, talking with her, talking with them, with a the couple, um, that eventually I I said it to Jack. We had just had sex. We were laying downstairs and I didn't even know what I was going to say. I w- we were just laying. I remember that we were on our backs again. Of course, it's easier to say something when you're not looking right at someone. Right. <laughs> we're laying on our backs. And I said, I can't believe we haven't had sex with anyone else for like eight years. I said, can you believe we Mm. haven't had sex with anyone else for eight years? And he said, "Uh, yes, (laughs) I I can. He had been married for 20 years Mm. prior to our marriage. And he's like, "Uh, yes. Um, Is there something else you'd like to say? (laughs) I'm like, oh, was it that obvious? Um, um, Well, yeah, I guess I was just kind of thinking that like, you know, I mean, if we're married for like another 20 years or, you know, let's just say in in like 20 years, you know, I might I might want to be with somebody else. You know, I didn't tell him that I was already sexting with an ex-boyfriend, you know, or that I was like 
really not talking about 20 years from then, but like, you know, could we do this tomorrow? Yeah. But he was really, he was very calm in his response. And basically that was the moment that I was like, okay, we're open. That was it. I did it. And I had no idea. Hmm. I had no idea how much more complicated it was than that. The the sort of the sub subtitle of Men, Myself and I is a memoir and how not to. Hmm. It's a little bit of a cautionary tale. We just dove right in. Don't do what we did. We could give you lots of reasons to support Labyrinths on Patreon, including ad-free episodes and exclusive patron-only content. But why not hear it direct from a listener? Hi, this is Cannon. I'm a big supporter of the Labyrinths Patreon page because the work that these people do is really thoughtful and it's one of my favorite podcasts and Patreon accounts in the world. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson. Jack had a, he went back east for a, a you know, it was a, gr- a group, a reunion of um, some people that he had worked with and he reconnected with an old flame and I was like, have fun, you know? I was like really hoping that he'd go and like get his groove on, right? Like, mm. do it, babe. And he uh, talked to her about it and just said, yeah, you know, we're over dinner, you know, we're just opening our marriage. And she was, she had sent me a card and the card was like, thank you so much for being open to Jack and I, you know, getting together and seeing each other. I really appreciate your trust. And and this was just for dinner. And I was like, oh, no, you can totally have sex with my husband. Like, it'd be (laughs) great if you did. Like, let's just see what happens if you guys do. Right. But he pitched her pitched her the idea or kind of suggested it, you know, and she she told him we were playing with fire. And she said that, you know, she didn't want any part of it. Mm. And um, she reacted very strongly. And we talked about it. And I just remember going, what does she know? You know, like, oh, we know better. But you know, a lot of those same people are divorced because their monogamous marriage didn't work over time. Exactly. Something that I think a lot about is, you know, people people go into their marriage thinking that they're so unique. They're often very young, you know, with little life experience as adults. They're, you know, maybe in their 20s or even early 30s, relatively little life experience as adults, as independent adults. And the, the, expectation is forever. The expectation is for the rest of their lives, you know. And of the of those marriages, 50% or whatever it is, it's very close to 50% of those marriages don't last. Right. What I have always marveled at is the marriages that do. Hmm. Because it seems it seems like there's there is a contingent of smug marrieds. We're better than you because we're still married. But hmm. how many of those people are self-expressed, are free? feel still in touch with their own agency and autonomy. And especially for women, you know, I feel really that was, I would say that that was the, what compelled me was I did not want to be a woman that had, you know, basically aged with her husband, kind of living his life, kind of living the expectations, kind of like conforming to what was expected of me and doing my duties and completely sacrificing my own joy, my passion, my vitality and sense of connection to all that is. Mm -hmm. And that was really the driving, like, the thread underneath all of this that was like, I will not be that woman. I did not, I was not created. I was not born. I'm not living this life so that I can basically like, it felt to me like being the walking dead, you know? Mm. And maybe it's, maybe it's just a, a product of, I mentioned that, you know, growing up with childhood trauma, maybe it's the product of growing up with childhood trauma that, you know, I have sort of a wild side or that I have this need to kind of go my own way and do my own thing. And and that I'm not, um, I'm not very good at getting online and kind of, mm-hmm. you know, doing what's expected, um, because I, that didn't work, you know, that mm-hmm. that didn't, that never worked for our family. So yeah. I've I've found my own way. But there's a lot of freedom there. And what I see now, and what I'm discovering now that I've been sharing the book, is that 
it's a message that resonates. It especially resonates with women, but it also resonates with men. And I think we are all doing ourselves a great disservice by not having these conversations. Mm. And that, I guess, ultimately is why I felt so strongly about sharing the book. There was a moment that I was in the studio with with Jeff, and he said, oh, I'm just going to go, you know, wrap up some couple things. Um, but let me, you know, you, why don't you listen to yesterday's recording for a few minutes of that, you know, just to kind of get warmed up while I go take care of a couple things. And so I was just standing in the studio, listening to my own voice, read myself back a chapter. And it got, it was the end of the chapter. It was like the last three minutes. And at the end of the chapter, <laughs> I just pulled off the headphones and I said, God damn it. Like that is, this is why I'm scared of this. It's why I'm scared to release it is because it's powerful mm -hmm. and it means something. And I'm not saying that as you know, a person that's like trying to sell a book. I'm saying that as a person who believes that these are conversations that we need to be having more often. This is a powerful, meaningful, significant conversation because we're talking about the life essence in all of us. We're talking about vitality. Sexuality is not just a penis in a, in a vagina. It's like, that is, that is like, <laughs> I wish there were different words for it right. because sexuality rea rea is, it's an expression of who we are, and it's an exploration, and it's so psychological, and it's so nuanced. There's so much more to it than a penis and a vagina, or two vaginas, or two penises, or whatever, however you're doing your thing. Like, it's so much more than that, and it's it's a, a place, I think, that people can really learn about themselves, and it's a place that people can heal. Mm. And we tend to bastardize it and to make it into this perverse, sick thing, and that it's 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 such a disservice that we do to ourselves. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the thing that I feel like is going to be one of the most powerful takeaways for readers is this exploration or this this processing of the relationship between trauma and exploration, the relationship mm. between trauma and questioning, mm -hmm. which I think you know, I'm curious to know what your your thoughts on that relationship are, because is it always the case that mm. someone who's been through something dramatic automatically becomes an, a questioning person? Mm -hmm. Or or is that just the response of a few select folks um, like yourself and me, mm -hmm. <laughs> where we think, like, for me, I'm definitely a similar way, where, like, trauma is happening, I'm attempting to process it, and it makes me question everything. Mm -hmm. So thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I consider it actually a great gift to have been raised the way that I was because my mom, my parents separated when I was about 18 months old and I didn't have a relationship with my dad. I really have never had a relationship with my dad, which created, that's its own problem, certainly. However, because I didn't grow up with a mom and a dad in my house and this expectation of like the beaver cleaver kind of family. It freed me from trying to live for my parents. It freed me from that. I, I don't have the filter in my brain that says, what would my mom think? What would my dad think? I'm not afraid of my, well, I'm afraid of my dad, but in a different way. I'm not afraid of like what my dad thinks of me. You know, right. I, I was more like safety afraid of my dad. Um, so I think that that was a great gift because so many people, the voice that they hear in their head is their parents or is their minister or is their whatever, you know. And I really grew up to be as a self-governed person from the time I was pretty young. My mm -hmm. mom was working full time. I'm the youngest of four siblings. I think by the time my oldest sister is 14 years older than I am. So I think by the time I was coming of age in my adolescence, I think my mom was really tired, yeah. understandably. And I was doing okay. You know, I really did well for myself. I was very motivated. I had a job when I was 15. Um, and, you know, it was really... Um, seeking that autonomy. And I don't know that I would have if I had been raised differently. I don't I don't know that I would have been um, as questioning. I don't know if I would have been as willing to take risks. I probably would have taken 
fewer. I, I, I may I may have been less impulsive. <laughs> I think that's that's maybe one of the darker sides of growing up right. with trauma is um, impulsive impulsivity. But um, it it definitely is a gift in some respects. And it's like anything. There's two sides of every coin, right? So there there are great gifts of growing up with a more traditional style family and you know parents that love you and are there for you and and whatever. And my mom was certainly there for me, but not in the authoritarian way. And so I learned to do that for myself. I think that to thine own self be true. You know, that was tr- that was true for me early on and has been something that I've continued to explore. I think it's I think it's the work of life for all of us is to to learn what that means and to learn how to live that for ourselves. And some people value it more than others. So to, it's more important to some people than others. It's very important to us. I hear you saying that it's also very important to you. So that's very important to me. I didn't have as far to go as I think some people do, who start feeling like they belong to other people more than they belong to themselves. Mm. I think I grew up feeling like I belonged to a culture and the expectations of the culture, but not my family of origin. And I think it's easier to break free of the cultural norms and the cultural expectations than it is your intimate relationships with your family members. Right. So I I didn't have as far to travel, Mm. you know. Yeah. When you embarked on this journey with Jack, um, did you feel like you knew where you were going and and what you were getting into? Mm-hmm. I was going to have sex with other people, and I was getting into bed with them. That was <laughs> definitely what was going to happen as soon as possible. And I didn't imagine, remotely imagine, the ways that things might go sideways. I thought because I didn't join a dating site right away, I was like, oh, look at me. Oh, I'm so discerning. Look at me using (laughs) discretion and caution and care. And no, I just wasn't quite ready. And as soon as I did join a dating site, it was like, you know, off to the races, basically. So not to, you know, just get anyone to not read the book, because there's a lot of uh, escapades to to explore. But can you share an example of... A, mo- a, a learning moment. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of those how not to. <laughs> yeah, how not to. Um, I, you know, I met someone, um, I don't know, three three years ago or something. I don't know. A, a, a guy I went out with on a date. He was he and his wife were exploring non-monogamy, and I was one of his first dates that he went out on. And he told me they had been exploring it for years. Mm. They had been talking about it. They had been revisiting it. They had been hypothetically, you know, kind of just not, not role-playing necessarily, but just kind of experimenting it. You know, it was like a thought experiment in their marriage and the way that they were talking about it and approaching it. And I was really impressed by that by the intentionality and the care, you know, that to me was, um, you know, by the time we opened our marriage, I didn't have years. I really did not have the patience for that. Um, I've already said that I'm a fairly impulsive person, so (laughs) that wouldn't have worked. But I would say that that was definitely, um, that was a learning, was to go slowly, take your time, and wade in. You know, that was something that Jessa, um, the woman that I met at the ayahuasca ceremony, and her husband, Bobby, when they opened their relationship, they started dating, I think Jessa had a friend, as I recall. She had a friend that, that, you know, they kind of like kissed one night when they had a couple drinks or something like that. And the gal was going to leave, but they had been drinking. And so they said, why don't you stay? And then they ended up having a threesome. And then they started dating her as a couple. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, it's a little different when you as a couple have invited someone else into your marriage. Right. You're not out with someone else. You're not no one's you know, staying at home. Right. No one's sitting at <laughs> home pacing while the other person's out on a date or on an overnight with someone else, you know, and potentially falling in love with that person. Because, of course, it triggers those deep fears and attachment. You know, if you if you have a, an attachment wound from childhood, it's going to come up when you approach non-monogamy. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, that was something that they did. It was sort of accidental. They 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 weren't approaching non monogamy like oh let's let's be non monogamous. It was something that sort of happened incidentally, but that they did well because it, they sort of waded into it. And then eventually they dated people individually, but they already kind of had their feet underneath them. Um, so I think that was certainly a learning. Another learning that I think is really important that I have only understood, of course, with time, is the value of time. And I say that because I had a relationship um, that. You know, I when I met him, I thought, oh, this is going to be a one night stand, 
And you know, we had a nice night. It was a fun night, but I was like, I was leaving for camp and I was going to go be working at the camp all summer. And I was just like, oh, whatever. Who, what? I was not at the time thinking like, oh, this is going to be a long-term relationship. But the next morning I woke up and I was like, oh, wow, I feel really comfortable with him. And that was really fun last night. And I like this guy and oh, maybe I will see him again. And so we started dating and that relationship evolved with me remarkably because this was such a, a you know, this period of time after separating from Jack uh, was such a volatile time. So it is remarkable to me that that relationship was able to withstand my variability and the process while I was writing this book and so forth. But what I learned is that, you know, he and I, while, yeah, we had a sexual relationship, we also were knitting together a friendship. We were sort of weaving a friendship over shared time, shared values, you know, our kids meeting, different things we would do. And that only comes with time. Mm -hmm. And that relationship is, you know, potentially a relationship that I could imagine having for the rest of my life, you know, because of its unique shape, its unique form. You know, I think a lot of people approach non-monogamy expecting the, the traditional form and shape of a relationship that they've always known, that it's going to be on an escalator, that they're going to meet and they're going to fall in love, and then they're going to cohabitate and then they're going to get married. And like non-monogamy is a completely different thing. And what you realize when you start to, when you, when you break that form, when you break that mold, is there is no mold. Mm. You can actually create the relationship that works for you. It could be with men. It could be with women. It could be a thruple or a quadruple or a, you know, it could be a community of 50 people and everybody fucks when they feel like it. Like, you know what I mean? Like to each their own. I really, right. <laughs> you know, that sounds like a lot of drama and a lot of work to me. But, you know, a lot of communication. A needs lot that. of communication <laughs> and like hours and hours. But yeah, so it's, you know, you just realize what's possible with time and patience. And it depends on the people. It entirely depends on the people. I think that it's a common mistake that people go into non-monogamy thinking that they're answering, that, that it's the answer to a sexual issue. They're going to, they're going to, they have a sexual problem and they're going to fix it with sex. And it's not that. It's really not. It's a different lifestyle. It's a different relationship model. It's a different way of thinking. And it really, I think, invites you into questioning so many other aspects of life that we take for granted, that this is the way it is. Why do I go to work every day at my job from nine to five, even though I don't really like it and da da da? Because mm -hmm. I got to pay the bills. Well, yes. And mm -hmm. you could maybe do with less. Yeah. To reduce your income, perhaps, but doing a job that you love. You know, you start to think about that. What do I really want? There's a, there's a, I, um, one of the chapters is really just exploring these questions of like, what, wait, <laughs> there's there's what culture told me I wanted mm -hmm. and how I could how I could fit in and be normal, which was really important to me because I had a bad dad, right? So I was like, I don't want to be the kind of person that has a bad dad. I, I don't want, I'm going to pass as a person that has like a good family life. Nobody's going to know anything about my like weird family life at home, right? I'm going to I mean, I like pass as normal. So I have to conform and fit in. But then when you start to realize like, oh, wait, no, I don't have to buy into that bullshit. I don't have to be a size four. How do I feel about my body? Like, I'm kind of curvy. Like, I kind of actually love it. <laughs> I love my body. You know, like, oh, go figure. Like, there are so many, there's so much freedom beyond what we're sold. And I mean, literally sold by companies that want us to be unhappy and want us to buy their products to feel better about ourselves. Like... Oh, I could go on and on. About that. That's not why we're here. <laughs> you know, like, I think that one of the, the big potential mistakes in entering into this space is not realizing how purposeful you need to be. And a lot of times you're being guided by your gut and trying to pair your feelings with or trying to, like, make sense of your feelings can be really tough. And I think that's one of the reasons why culture provided a model, because mm. it was like, here, so you don't have to think about it. Here's monogamy. <laughs> 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 How did you learn to process what you were feeling and to manifest it? And did you ever feel just completely lost? Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> it's it's difficult because I couldn't talk to, I mean, my friends were all heteronormative, you know. I didn't even have any gay friends that I could really talk to about it because to them, I was like, it's threatening, you know. And it, 
you have a lot of feelings to deal with that are not, un, you know, they're not dissimilar to the kind of feelings that we all have when we're dating. You know, will he call, won't he call, some of those kinds of things. But it's it's very threatening to people that are in stable relationships, I think, to confront some of these ideas. And so I found it difficult because I didn't have a lot of people to talk to. Mm. And the non-monogamous people that I knew were not very stable, actually. Mm. <laughs> and you know, there was one partner in particular that I developed a very strong connection with and attachment to, and he was in a primary partnership. And part of the shape of our relationship was that he didn't know anything about me personally, and it it was very intentional. I held him at, I kept him at bay. And I think that was my way of trying to separate like the personal and the passionate. I didn't I didn't want to fall in love with him. I knew he wasn't a safe enough person for me to like fall for, but I also really liked the relationship that we had. So those were really difficult feelings to process. It was very confusing. I had a therapist and Jack and I went to therapy. Um, we found actually a quite useless couples therapist um, <laughs> that was... Oh, good. <laughs> I remember it was like $300, I think. Our sessions were like 90 minutes or two hours or something, and it was like $300. And we'd go and we'd just be like, did that help at all? You know, and just like, I don't know, we're doing what we're supposed to, right? We're supposed to be in therapy. We're supposed to be like talking about our feelings, but like oftentimes I would leave more upset or more riled or whatever, you know, it was actually quite useless. But then we went to a different therapist and she, by that point, she basically looked at us and said, this, uh, this is probably not going to work for you guys. <laughs> I can't fix this. Can't, this, this is more, situation. Yeah, yeah, this is intractable. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I guess just to agree with you, <laughs> there's a lot of really complex, complex feelings. Yeah. And I and maybe that's what the book was, you know. I, I struggled with the title, and it was called Coming Apart, Revelations of an Open Marriage. And then, like, at the 11th hour, I changed it to Men, Myself, and I. And that was related to a, a big learning from actually writing the book. I didn't know it about myself. Coming apart seemed like, oh, it's kind of clever. There's a double entendre. I'm so smart. <laughs> um, but Men, Myself, and I felt like a more um, apt title. And I think it speaks to that conflict inside of yourself. Exactly. Too. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. And I and so that was really, I think, where I worked out a lot of the feelings at the time. How do you process that with a partner? You know, and Jack was having his own unique experience. And I I will tell you, I am really bad. I've actually never had an opportunity to be like a good, what is it, a metamor, you know, like to be a good, say Jack is having a relationship with someone else and I'm at home so happy for him feeling all this compersion, which is that experience of like gladness for your partner you know mm. you're like trying to give your partner the opportunity to feel compersion and he's yeah. like yeah but I don't yeah <laughs> and you're like damn it <laughs> but I'm giving you every opportunity look how happy I am <laughs> yeah I mean I was I was horrible I was horrible because what I didn't know is that Jack was going to start dating and it would absolutely kick off an attachment wound that I had from childhood that made me so petrified of losing him and so uh, disconnected from myself. I mean, I didn't I didn't know that I was disconnected from myself. I didn't know that actually relative to dating and men, I didn't have much of a sense of self that I used men. I identified myself by the man that I was partnered with or that I was dating. Mm. None of that got kicked off when I was in a stable marriage with Jack. It was only when things became unstable and became open and when I was the attachment wound was getting triggered by dating other people that say maybe didn't text me back or didn't want what I wanted or whatever, that this like monster fucking reared its head, you know? And I was not, not a good partner in non-monogamy. Jack was way more chill about things and way more relaxed. I couldn't process those feelings with him because I didn't know, I had no idea what was happening for me. So I couldn't, you know, how could I talk about something I wasn't even aware of? He couldn't process because he did, he didn't have the inclination to, you know? Right. He he wasn't interested in bringing that home to me. He didn't see the necessity. He didn't see the point of it. Or he just didn't have a lot of feelings. He went and had sex with someone new, thought it was fun, it, you know. Gave done him, and done. Right. <laughs> and he came home and that was the end of it, you know? Hmm. So do you feel like your out of the labyrinth at this point? Mm. Oh, 
I do. Hmm. You know? What's the shift? How do you know? Yeah, the shift is, the shift has absolutely nothing to do with non-monogamy. It has everything to do with my relationship with myself. Hmm. And what I learned as a result of writing, the process of writing this book, it's really a story of identity. And it was only through living that story and kind of living in the questions and continuing on, you know, not giving up, but continuing on and doing the work of it, turning over the stones and reflecting on the experience. It was only through that experience that I was able to feel like I had myself in a way I never had before. It was only that through that process that I was able to trust myself to, um, I mean, it sounds so precious or so kind of cheesy or cliche to say, but I, I didn't know that I, that I was so willing to abandon myself when it came to men. Mm. I had no idea that their, impo- their validation was so important to me. And I have arrived at a place now in my life where it's not anymore. It's a, a, a man's validation or a woman's or another writer's or my family's or no one else's validation is more important to me than my own. And I feel truly free and really fucking powerful. And that is how I know that it's shifted is because I feel a, such a, I have such a different sense of relationship with, to myself. In my experience, the, you know, the whole being in prison for a crime I didn't commit thing, I remember, like, for the longest time thinking that there was no way that I would ever feel like I belonged to people um, because it was such an insane experience and so unique. I'm I'm sorry to pause you, but what does that mean, you would belong to people? um, I felt like... um, I felt like I would never, I mean, to be honest, Mm. I thought that I would never have a partner. I would never Mm. really be able to connect with people again. Mm -hmm. Um, I was afraid that I was just kind of alone um, and no one would really ever understand me. Mm. Um, this, This came as a kind of consequence of like coming home from prison and realizing that against my will, I had been changed by the experience and there was an expectation, like even my own family didn't quite know who I Mm -hmm. was anymore. Mm -hmm. And there was, I found myself oddly sort of, uh, it's not that there was like dysfunction or anything. It was more just a feeling of, I was unaligned. I didn't have the, the alignment with the people around me anymore. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where to look for alignment. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was sort of doomed to not be aligned and to not therefore belong to people anymore. Thank you for clarifying. That makes perfect sense. And um, I've since, you know, talked about this experience and talked about that aspect of the experience, thinking like part of the reason why I ever questioned even talking about this was you know, the so what of it, it was like, well, is it going to actually, who's this going to speak to? I'm just talking, like, I don't know anybody else who could relate to this experience. Mm. But that was also a lack of my own imagination, not understanding that how people process other people's experiences. Oh, yeah. And not having an appreciation that somebody going through something completely different could be feeling the exact same things. And so I think one of the things that one of the other reasons why I back at that old coffee shop, I encouraged you to just really, you know, take ownership of your story and put it out there is because you never know who it's going to reach at the right time. And the thing that I've discovered since taking that risk of putting myself out there is that I've had people come up to me and say, you Putting yourself out there in this moment and in arriving me at, at arriving to me at this moment in my life was the difference between me killing myself or not. Mm. And like you just never know 
mm-hmm. what somebody else in the world is going through and how sharing just something for the sake of sharing it can can meet them um, and find them mm. and be the thing that they needed without you ever knowing or you, intending it to be that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the really beautiful things about being vulnerable um, and being willing to take that risk because you never know. So I, I really appreciate that perspective. I and you're absolutely right. You know that that a circumstance, the the sort of raw aspects of a circumstance might have nothing to do with the specifics. It's just relating to feeling alone, feeling isolated, not belonging to yourself, not belonging to other people. Um, even just when you were saying that, I was like, oh, absolutely, I know what you mean, not belonging to people. It non-monogamy felt a little bit that way to me. I was like an island, you know, mm. because I I couldn't talk to people. Nobody understood. You know, people, if you're just like, God, my husband's such an asshole. He's golfing again. You know, like, <laughs> oh, I get it. You know, like, yeah, you're home with the kids all day. And like, it's frustrating. You were home all week with them. And now on a Saturday, he wants to go. It's his leisure time. Great. But you're still with the kids at home. Mm-hmm. Like, legit. But like, your girlfriend is going to understand that because she has her own version of that. And right. um. And you imagine that people aren't going to understand as, you know, non-monogamy or or in your very unique circumstances that no one's going to understand that. And I wonder if, you know, if maybe, I mean, I'm curious how you found your way back to that feeling of belonging, you know, and I'm mm. curious, hearing you say that, I'm curious, like, there probably would have been people that would have understood. I imagine they wouldn't understand. And I didn't know how to approach them to say, I'm really hurting. This didn't go well. I feel horrible. I'm afraid I've ruined my marriage. I'm afraid I ruin everything I touch. I'm afraid I'm never going to have a healthy, lasting relationship or whatever. There's probably other people that have those fears too, that right. they have ruined a good relationship or that they, you know. So I'm curious, how did you find your way back to people? Um, well, one is that I realized that my experience is not as unique as mm. I thought it was, mm-hmm. um, that in fact, a lot of people go through this experience, um, and I met them. Um, but on top of that, there was just, um, there was actually a really unique moment in a poetry class mm. where I I was not writing about prison. I was writing about other things, but like emotionally the things I was writing about were about feeling trapped or feeling like I didn't have any control over my life and that people were just hurting me and without consequence. And so like those were the sort of emotions that I was processing and grappling with in these poems that I was writing for this class. And they happened to really connect with this other girl in my class. And we started going out and getting coffee together on the weekend and just talking about poetry. And then one day uh, she came and met me for coffee and she sat down and she was just like, oh my God, you're Amanda Knox. (laughs) And I was like... Oh, no. (laughs) I'm so sorry I didn't tell you. Well, no, I was thinking, oh, no, she probably has Googled me. And now who knows what she thinks. Mm. And she was like, she saw my face and she was like, no, 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 don't don't misunderstand me. She was like, I was raped when I was a teenager. Mm. And the thing that you're talking about in your poetry, all of those feelings are how I felt. And and she's like, so, you know, just so you know, you're not alone. And I'll never forget that because it was such an important lesson to me that the feeling of trauma is something that is so universal. Mm. and. And therefore, you don't need some kind of special experience to be able to help another person, to relate to another person or to help them heal necessarily. Mm. So I really, I mean, that's part of the reason why I started this podcast, Labyrinths, was because I understood that everyone has a moment in their life when they felt super lost and they don't know how to get out. And 
the the journey of finding your way again or finding yourself again is a universal experience. It just takes all of these amazing different forms. And so that was the idea of trying to replicate that experience of having resonance between another person, knowing that, like, the, the weird thing about my trauma is everybody knows about it. Yeah. <laughs> so they think they do. They think they know about it, yeah. yeah. And so, but also it's a kind of a, a weird blessing because it means that people want to share their mm. stories with me because mm-hmm. they almost feel like they know about me, so they want to sort of reciprocate and be like, hey, I know about you, so can I just, like, for I, I need it to not be weird. Let me tell you about my thing. Yes, and yeah. I'm like, yes, please, you know? Aww. So that's another way of, like, of feeling connection and feeling belonging mm. again mm. is, like, feeling people who are, se- like, seeking you out for that common human universal experience. Well, it's so uh, remarkable. That was something that really struck me about meeting you, if I may, was (laughs) seeing how available you are to people and how compassionate and forgiving you are. But truly that you would make yourself available to like a stranger, you know, to just like, oh, sure, I'll, you know, I'll I'll listen to your, you know, the thing that's like kind of on your mind or whatever. And if I can have something to say, if I have something to say about it, I'd be happy to share it. You know, Um, I think that's so, it's so beautiful. It felt like such a gift to me to receive Uh it. And what I hear you saying and what I had never thought about is that it was also a gift for you in the sense that it uh, enabled you to feel a sense of belonging to, to, each other. I mean, it, it, it's a Ram Das quote, I think. We belong to each other. Hmm. And what you just said embodies that. It really reminds me of that. And I think it's so true. I think it's so true. And it's so beautiful. And it's the um, sort of the essence of being human, hmm. you know. And there's so much in our culture that divides us and separates us. Indeed, trauma, even as a very isolating experience, even though it's so common and it's yeah. something that we share, we have it in common, but our experience feels so unique and it feels so isolating. But somehow getting over that hump so that we can come to that shared humanity of just the the basic of feeling alone, feeling trapped, feeling scared, um, having something taken from you, mm-hmm. you know, w- without your consent, mm-hmm. um, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where can people find your book? They can find it on Substack. So this is a, a unique, um, a unique way that I decided to publish the book. I have already said that I like to do things my own way. <laughs> Um, it's called Men, Myself, and I, Revelations of an Opened Marriage. And people can, if they go to Substack and search Men, Myself, and I, it'll come up. That's where to find it. All right. Well, congratulations Thank for you so finally much. giving birth. Uh, <laughs> yes. Now, it's been so interesting now to, you know, the, I think when I met you, I, I kind of liken that to transition, you know, in labor where things are getting crazy. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> it was like, oh, my God, I'm going to do this thing. It's really scary. It's really fucking scary. And I, I, I do want to mention, though, people have been so kind, largely. Mm. I did get a death threat on, on Instagram. You know what that's Well, like. that's how you know you're a success. <laughs> <laughs> like I've really made it. You actually mentioned that that might happen, and I was like, "You're right." Oh shit! And then, sure enough, some crazy dude posted a bunch of comments and was like, "You don't deserve to live," and just all this misogyny. It was really, really quite jarring. And I was like, "All the more reason that I should be releasing this book." God damn it! Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been really wonderful to see people respond to the to the vulnerability and um, and to say like I, I'm so moved by this and I hope I really hope that it, it, it helps others feel more free as always we hope you'll continue getting lost with us find us on Twitter at Amanda Knox at man under bridge on Instagram at Amama Knox at MC carbon And you can learn more about our work and how to support it at knoxrobinson.com. If you're loving Labyrinths, please tell your friends, coworkers, and relatives. Be that annoying person with the uninvited podcast recommendation. They'll thank you for it. Labyrinths is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. This episode was written and produced by us with theme music by Josh Budo Karp. In the Labyrinth's podcast system, the listener is serenaded by two separate but equally important hosts, Amanda Knox, who brings authenticity and empathy, 
and Christopher Robinson, who brings intellectual curiosity. These are their stories. What do you think, Knox? Looks like a podcast junkie shot up with one too many ads. Should have become a patron from the looks of it. Who wouldn't prefer ad-free episodes and signed books and live video hangouts over overdosing on ads in an alleyway? Don't patronize me, Knox. Leave that to the listener. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson.